Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another edition for you Longhorn season ticket holders for our virtual huddle as we visit with members of the Texas Longhorn football coaching staff. My name is Craig Way. Glad to have you with us and also pleased to be joined by Longhorn's associate head coach for tight ends and special teams, Jay Bulwer. Now, uh, Jay, this is not intended to make you feel old, uh, but uh, or me for that matter. But, uh, you know, uh, folks are going to remember you uh, certainly from your playing days and a student coach at uh, the University of Texas. I roll it all the way back to 1988, 1989, when you were playing for Mike Farda at Nimitz High School in Irving. And I'm doing playoff games on our Dallas Fort Worth affiliate KRLD uh, back in the day when you're playing uh, Trimble Tech of Fort Worth and Odessa yes. Permian. And and all of those kinds of things. So welcome to the chat. And like I said, that wasn't intended to make you feel old. It was just to let everybody know that you are a native Texan through and through, and it's good to have you back in the Lone Star State. Very glad to be here. And uh, that didn't make me feel old. I still feel young, even though that was in the 80s, late 80s. Um, but uh, Texas high school football is, is something else. And playing for Mike Farda, rest in peace, uh, was, was, a, was a great part of my life. Well, uh, it, it's certainly good to have you. And, and I know you, uh, you've you been on record as saying uh, how good it feels to be back in the state of Texas. And uh, and I know your wife feels the same way about it. T tell everybody a little bit about that that uh, the journey when you decided to come back and how, what, what was it? She kept the, the bedroom slippers, is that right, for all, all the years? <laughs> I forgot I told that story. That, <laughs> that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, my wife and I met at the University of Texas. Uh, she's a graduate from the business school here. And um, yeah, we, when we went to Oklahoma, uh, she was, she was, um, she always kept her Longhorn slippers. And I had to always remind her when the guys would come over, I say, hey, look, I, I don't mind you wearing your slippers, but you have to get rid of them when, when the players come over because, you know, obviously we were in enemy territory, but we were both Longhorns and, uh, that's something that she always kept. So she'd pull them out when, 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 when they weren't there. And when, and then uh, when they would come over, she, she put them away. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's an interesting dynamic for us to be uh, back on the 40 acres now. So I, I've got to ask you what her reaction was when you first broke the news to her that you had the opportunity to be a part of coach Herman's staff and a return to the 40 acres. What was her response and her reaction? Well, uh, first and foremost, we didn't sleep for about three nights. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the whole process was was a little bit longer than what we anticipated. Uh, when I told her that uh, Coach Herman called me, uh, she told me, she looked at me in like, in, in complete awe, like, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, uh, we have a chance to go back and, you know, her being uh, a sorority member uh, here at the university, uh, having all those friends and and she just started, you know, the thoughts just started going through her head as well as mine, you know, just all the friends that would, would reach out to us wanting, get, wanting tickets, you know, uh, particularly football coaches tickets to the game. And um, it, it, it was just a, a long three nights for us. We, we really had some uh, interesting discussions about uh, possibilities as well as uh, just praying, um, you know, uh, faith, faith is number one in our lives, um, followed by our family and, uh, you know, we got down on our knees and, and prayed quite a bit uh, for, for uh, the spirit to guide us to the right, right decisions. Jake, you mentioned uh, about her being in a sorority. It brings to mind the, the term of traditions. And we've got a, a list of questions for this virtual huddle from fans. And one of the fans wanted to know, what's your favorite Texas tradition? <sighs> well, <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it uh, as, a, as a member of the Longhorn staff, but uh, having that tower lit number one when you win a natty. Uh, that's my whole, that's my whole goal. You know, uh, I've gotten a taste of winning one uh, in my career. Uh, Gene Chizik and I worked together uh, at Auburn and um, uh, it, it's just nothing like it. Uh, nothing like it in the world. And I, the day I won it, I thought immediately, man, that would be really special to win one at Texas. And uh, that's, that's the goal. That's my, that's my whole, objective in coming here in terms of uh the things that we we talked about your time away in seven years there in norman oklahoma uh, but your time in the 90s uh first as a student athlete then as a student coach and the grad assistant at the university of texas what what would you say if anything 
has changed most of all? It, it, it's another question submitted here. What, what do you think has changed most of all from the time you were at Texas before to how it is right now? Well, um, gosh, I mean, a place that I'm so familiar with, I mean, there's a lot of things that have changed, but there's, there's a lot of things that are still the same. I mean, we're still in the same stadium, <laughs> you know, even though there's been, you know, um, updates and whatnot that have made to it. It's kind of funny. Uh, one of the locker rooms that we're, we're out working out of right now is the old track locker room. And I always wanted, wanted when I saw those track athletes back when I was here, because the old track used to be around uh, the field. And, um, and I remember like, man, I wonder what that looks like in there. Well, now I know. <laughs> I know exactly what it looks like. In, uh, and uh, anyway, so I mean, it, I don't know if I can just pick one thing out in particular. Uh, I just think the city is, is uh, much more vibrant. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot going on here now. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of traffic, but with that comes a lot of uh, things to do as well, too. So uh, that's probably the biggest difference here in Austin. Uh, for me, not so much just the university, but just the the, the opportunity to do so many different things uh, outside of football. Uh, and, uh, and and that's probably the part that we enjoy the most, just being back in Austin and being able to do those things. Well, clearly, uh, you know, you as a person have, have developed over time. And one of the questions we had was uh, now as a coach, what makes you and your style different from say, not only you as a student coach, but even you as a young man, and, and what makes you different, say, from other coaches with regard to how you deal with special teams, how you deal with tight ends? What what makes you different? Um, I'm 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 really a, a student of the game, as are as are most coaches, I guess. But uh, the thing that I try to pride myself in is identifying personnel, identifying personnel not only in recruiting but also on your football team to do various jobs that uh, I know exactly what we're looking for on whatever special teams that we're on. Uh, obviously my position, uh, I think that's a gift, um, being able to identify guys that maybe somebody might look at and say, well, you know, there's not a whole lot he can do. I can't tell you how many times in my career that I've had a head coach tell me that and, and I say, hey, I believe in that kid. I believe that he can get this done. And uh, sure enough, the guy goes out there and shows out. And next thing you know, the head coach is talking about putting him in on offense and defense. And so that's one of the things I kind of pride myself in is just identifying our personnel and getting the best 11 guys on the football field. Not the best 11 football players, but the best 11 guys that can do a job and work together and uh, for the common good of this team. It sounds a little bit like what you just described in a nutshell, is what a coach expects of his special teams. And, and with the way that you direct special teams as well, what makes a special team truly special on either side of the kicking game, uh, whether uh, you're, you know, whether it's covering a punt or kickoff or protecting for punt or uh, kickoff uh, return? What, what, what makes special teams truly special? You know, that's a great question, Craig. I really believe there's a lot of guys that, get hung up in the things that aren't really important there. You know, obviously we want the field position game to reflect um, in, in the statistics at the end of the day. But uh, here at Texas, we believe in E4. E4 for us, to me, that, that, that makes special teams special. E4 is energy. E4 is energize the crowd, play with the edge and execute. And if you do that, you'll make timely plays that can be huge momentum swings in football games. And that's the quickest way, in my opinion, to change the momentum of, of, of a game is to make a big play on special teams. And you never know when they're coming. They're one shots, you know. And the average person, you know, might watch a game and not realize that a tackle inside the 20-yard line just ignited your team on kickoff coverage. You know, it just ignited it. And all of a sudden, your defense goes three and out, and they punt to you. And now you're across the 50 on a punt return and your offense is set up for a score. And that, that, that transition happens all the time. And even though you may not notice it on the, on the, uh, on the stat books, um, to me, when you ignite your football team like that and you give us an edge, that's what special, special teams is all about. That's what makes special teams special. You just brought up a, an interesting point because we had a question from a fan 
asking about with the rules changes and the varied uh, way that it is structured with kickoff or turn and, you know, but what is the best way to approach that? Because we see the fair catch is called for and sometimes fans may get frustrated with say, well, that guy could have probably brought it out to the 35, 40 yard line or whatever. And the, and the, the universal signal was up to call for a fair catch when he fielded it at the four yard line. And how much of that is judgment and how much of that is instruction? What, what's your philosophy on how you approach that sort of thing? First of all, from the kickoff return perspective. Well, uh, first and foremost, I think it's game plan wise each week. You know, what kind of kickoff team are you facing? Uh, what kind of hang time the kicker is getting on the ball? Um, you know, are you making a good decision to return that football? Whether you feel it on the, you know, you use a four. I would always imagine the four yard line is a, is a perfect opportunity to return a kick. But, but, um, but even without that, I mean, you just never know how much hang time that kick has. You know, when they move the ball up to the 35 yard line, and, um, you know, not, not back at the 30, you know, a four-second hang time kickoff, you know, dropping in on the four-yard line. Those guys are on top of you right now, you know. And then literally they're, they're right about the 25-yard line when, when you feel the football. That's where they are. So it, it, it goes into, you know, each and every week what that team is capable of, what your return team is capable of. That has a lot to do with it as well, too. And uh, just taking your, the, the right opportunities because getting the ball on the 25-yard line uh, after a fair catch is, is significant, you know, uh, that's, that's a significant field position thing. You I mean, you can return every kick from the goal line. And if you average the 25 yard line, you'd be just about leading the country and kickoff returns by the end of the year. So you just have to be intelligent with that and when you're doing it and when you're not, um, obviously with a great kickoff return team, man, you want to take everyone that you have a chance to take, take back to, to try. So, uh, so it just, there's a lot of you know, factors that go along with that. Safe to say the converse of that is when you've got a great kickoff guy like Cameron Dicker, it makes it a lot easier in covering the kicks downfield, isn't it? If he's taking care of his job and just taking it right out of the equation by booting it right out of the back of the end zone. Well, <laughs> I, I agree and disagree with that <laughs> because, uh, you know, um, the last two or three kickers that I've had uh, prior to last season, uh, we've been in the top, you know, one or two in the country in touchbacks. And what ends up happening a lot of times when you are like that is the guys take it for granted, right, when they're running down. And so every so often that, you know, 10% of, 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 of balls that actually drop in the field of play, the kickoff team, one, hasn't had much practice at it throughout the course of the year. And two, they're probably not ready to run down there and actually feel the kick because most of them do what? Go out the back of the end zone for touchbacks. So uh, that's kind of a gift and a curse a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, I take it all day, you know, because if you have a great kicker like that, you can always fire them up to eliminate the opposing team's kick returner. So uh, just by kicking touchback. So yeah, I, I take it, but, but it's kind of a double edged sword. I would imagine that there's probably what the, the necessity to, uh, I guess I would say emphasize that your guys stay in the moment that they stay intense just in case uh, Cameron's kicking off into a stiff breeze or something like that on the road somewhere or for whatever reason it pops up a little more, that they've got to be dialed in to make sure they're making the play and taking the proper angles uh, because a guy can bring it out, especially if he's a dangerous returner. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my job. Obviously, if there's some environmental factors that go along with it, I will alert them to that, that there's a possibility. I'm not so concerned with the ones that I think that might come in. It's the ones that I don't know when he just mishits it. You know, um, you know, as, as, as good a kickers as, as guys are at every – even at the, in the NFL, some of them drop in from time to time just because the kicker just didn't hit the sweet spot. So uh, those are the ones I'm more concerned with, not the windy days when I say, okay, we're going against a 25-mile-per-hour wind. Guys, let's get down the field and, and let's cover this kick because it's a good chance it's not going to be, be for a touchback. So uh, it's the ones that we don't know. Those are the ones that are dangerous ones. All right, let's talk punt return and, and punt coverage as well and, and the ongoing message that you have to your guys and how you deal with it. Okay, well, uh, you know, again, a lot of that stuff is game plan wise, so who, who the opponent is that you're playing, but uh, those are the two lead in uh, special team shooters. They're the ones you do the most, all right? So whether, whether at least most of the time, I mean, uh, you know, punt and punt return, man, they can change the game right now. Whether you block a punt, or return one for a touchdown. Uh, either one of those scenarios, man, you, that team that, you know, blocks that punt or scores that touchdown on punt return, more oftentimes than not, it wins the football game. Uh, punting, 
Uh, the flip side of that is obviously protecting your punter uh, and getting great coverage. Um, my philosophy uh, is a little bit different than from some. Um, I focus more on hang time and distance. Uh, that's, that's what I look for from an elite level punter. Uh, I think that those two combinations would, um, would almost ensure a fair catch with the type of speed that you have at here at Texas. So uh, we're, we're spending a lot of our time along with in protection, but fo fo focusing on our punter to uh, create great hang time and distance. Um, for a 40 yard punt, for example, we're looking for at least four second hang time, 45, four and a half second, 50, five second hang time. And that would give us enough time to get down the field and cover it and force a fair catch. Uh, truth be told, Jay, could, could you have imagined yourself when you were an offensive lineman at Texas in the early 90s, uh, 25, 28 years later, discussing hang time for a punter? Would, it, <laughs> would that have crossed your mind back then? Heck no. Uh, you know, it's funny that you say that. And you mentioned the old line. Um, you know, when I first started doing this, I was in, uh, I got introduced to special teams at Arizona. And one of the guys that worked there was a special teams coordinator in the NFL for the Giants and uh, later for the San Francisco 49ers by the name of Larry McDuff. Uh, I think he might have spent some time here on the 40 acres back when Dick Tomey was here. Um, but one of the things he said was, your O-line background, your attention to detail, being meticulous the way you are will serve you well as a special teams coordinator. And I heard that, and I just dove into it my first year, and I started thinking, you know what? He's exactly right. You know, there's so many things that, that uh, you know, that, you know, O-line coaches or O-linemen in terms of the technique and fundamentals and things that, that you, you spend time teaching progression, uh, having a teaching progression that's easy, that guys can understand and go out and execute. All those things uh, have helped me be the special teams coordinator that I am today. Jay, let's talk about the other area of, of concentration for you, tight ends. And, and, and let me get your thoughts on the excitement level you have about the guys you have in your area coming back to play this year. I'm very excited about all those guys, man. Uh, Kay Brewer, uh, the leader in the clubhouse right now, uh, he's smart, uh, uh, tough kid. Uh, really excited to get him on the field and, 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 and help him develop and grow into the player that he can be. Uh, you know, we got uh, a guy by the name of Jared Wiley, who was a uh, true freshman last year, uh, tall, rangy kid with, with uh, good strength. I'm, I'm, I'm pumped up about him as well. Uh, Malcolm Epps uh, has moved over to tight end now. Uh, he brings uh, a different element to the room, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying, you know, teaching him uh, how to play in the box. Uh, and, then, and then you got uh, Braden Librock. Uh, and, and Nate Hatter uh, are two freshmen, true freshmen guys that are, you know, uh, didn't get much, didn't get any playing time last year. I think Braden might have got a little bit uh, before he redshirted with that four-game rule. But, uh, but those two guys are all, all guys that I'm really pumped up about. Love the room. The guys are hard workers. Uh, they, they do anything I ask. They put the time in and uh, just looking forward to working with those guys and growing together. You brought up uh, Malcolm Epps. How much is there of, of a learning curve is there that he has had to encounter uh, going through this and making that transition over to the tight end spot? Well, you know, anytime you have a receiver, you know, moving in the box, the transition is the blocking. So it's about 50-50, you know, the routes and all that stuff. And conceptually, they stay the same. Uh, he's very, very well um, uh, prepared in that area. Uh, the, the other area, maybe not so much. Now, I haven't had a chance to get out there with him and actually see him, you know, go not having a spring ball. But, but we're teaching him the fundamentals, the technique, the body positions, and all those things that he needs to learn to be an effective blocker. And I've been in this situation before. I've had a kid play quarterback and transition to me in one year. And, and in that one year, he ended up getting drafted after that. Uh, so I, 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 I think that Malcolm will be able to pick it up um, I think that we'll be fine and, and hopefully have, give him a chance to uh, be able to go out there and compete for a starting position. You brought up Brayton Librock. Is in, in his case, do you notice a discernible difference between a guy, you brought up the four-game redshirt rule, for a guy that's even able to get some reps, some snaps in, in uh, the uh, four games or thereabouts, uh, four or fewer games, 
and come back. Do you, do you notice anything that's, that makes a guy like that say, have, if not necessarily a leg up, at least more of a comfort level as opposed to a kid who has not seen the field, has not been in a game at all? Well, now I'm relying on just my experience as a coach, uh, not knowing where Braden was before and where he is now, uh, having not been on, being on the field with him. But uh, I, I believe that does help guys. Going through the routine, uh, preparing to play a football game, traveling with the team, whatever that may entail, um, all those things to me help, help. You know, when you don't know what that's like, uh, then, then you're inexperienced in that area. So, you know, simulating – you know, playing is just as just as much and just as much experience or just as big as as going out there and actually playing. And so he got a chance to do that and he got a chance to play. So I think that's going to help him uh, down the road in terms of just being being more of a veteran as he starts to uh, work his way into the lineup. Here's one of those classic questions about uh, special teams, and it's that uh, sliding scale between guys who are starters who can contribute. Uh, whether they're starters on offense or defense with what they can contribute on special teams versus young guys who are trying to get on the field, trying to get some reps, trying to work their way up the ladder. How do you, as a, as a special teams coach, uh, balance all of that with what you need to have on the field from your unit? I, I think that's another great question, Craig. I always feel like you know, part of my job when, when done well and done right is to manage the football team in terms of not overutilizing one player or the other. Uh, I think that, you know, here we, we've, uh, we've used starters, some starters on special teams. Uh, you know, we've used our best players, particularly punt. Um, so, you know, there's a nice mixture of, you know, who does what and, and when and all that stuff like that and never just overutilizing one player. I think that that wears your football team out from the inside out. And I think you just got to do a great job as a special teams coordinator of putting the personnel in the right spot and, and giving a little here to get a little bit more somewhere else. And uh, when you do that the right way, you get more people involved and, um, and uh, you end up having, you know, in the fourth quarter, a team that's, that's ready to go. They're not overutilized. They understand their roles. They know, hey, I got to go out there and cover this punt. I'm not going to be on punt return. I'm not going to be on kickoff return, but I'm going to go down there and bust my tail and cover this punt. It's the first play of defense. So um, that's, that's, that's part of my job, you know, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta spread it out. You gotta uh, not overutilize one player, even if he can start on all four, if he's, if he's a starter on offense or defense, you can't play a kid on more than two. And then some of them you can't play on any just because that, that person might be too important offensively or defensively. Let's talk recruiting. Uh, in 1990, you weren't dealing with Twitter or, or, or Facebook, you know. Uh, yes. is, is that one of the, uh, the, especially Twitter and Instagram, would you say for today's student athletes, that is the biggest difference uh, that you have noticed in your time in the game as a coach uh, nowadays in looking at student athletes as it has evolved in the whole social media realm? Yeah, I think, you know, recruiting is evolving every single year. You know, the thing with those social media devices uh, or engines that you use, uh, they change. These kids change what they're using and uh, it's constantly evolving. So you got to stay ahead of the game. I absolutely love the recruiting process. I love getting to know the kids. I love getting to uh, get out there and, and uh, you know, and, and, and get on, you know, Twitter and, and DM a guy or, you know, like some of his comments and follow him. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quietly a stalker, to be honest with you. You know, I kind of stalk these guys and kind of figure out, you know, who is this guy? Who is this guy that I'm going to entrust to take care of my family? That I'm going to entrust at a university that means so very much to me. I want to understand what, we, what are we bringing into this university? Um, so I, I, I love it. I think now, which is different from back then, I think now you have a lot more information about kids than you used to, you know, you used to just rely on a high school head coach. Hey, give me, tell me about this guy. Well, I don't need the high school head coach to tell me everything about that kid. A lot of things I can see just through his social media and how people interact with him and whatnot. So, so uh, I think, I think we were able to do a more thorough job in recruiting now that all those things are available. Uh, before we wrap it up here, I'm, uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because it's, it's something that we ask of the coaches. What are you most looking forward to 
with this team this season? And I'm and I'm going to guess that the that the first answer is what all the coaches uh, at whatever level and whatever sport are saying. They're most looking forward to just getting an opportunity to get back with the student athletes, right? But once that all of this passes, that, <laughs> that is the exact truth, man. I just uh, I I can't believe that I'm here now and uh, in this situation, and I don't know when the season's going to start. I don't know what we're doing and what we're not doing. I'm just living every day um, and just playing it by ear. I'm trying to maximize, you know, every single day and in, in preparing our guys to get ready to go as best I can and doing what I can to get them ready to go. I'm trying to learn more about the team. Uh, I'm trying to inform them about what we're doing, uh, special teams wise or tight end wise. So, um, you know, having that uncertainty is certainly um, a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of a downer for me, but, but that's what I want to do. I mean, that's the thing that I'm looking forward to the most is just getting back out there on the field. Uh, by the way, rolling it back to recruiting again, it would be natural for folks to ask the question about when several different members of a coaching staff are on the coaching staff for the first time dealing with this, what we're going through with this, uh, with this pandemic might seem to make it more difficult in recruiting to an area where you just got there having played at Texas, knowing Texas, having been there, has that kind of, to use the popular phrase, he's a flatten the curve for you a little bit in terms of what you've had to do in terms of recruiting? Right. Well, uh, you know, being able to, to relay a message across to a player about this school is not going to be my issue. I, I know everything about this school, ins and outs. Um, you know, the player history I've been following even since I left here, you know, as, as, a, as a coach at other institutions, I've been following what has been going on here. Uh, so that's not the issue. But as we all know, recruiting is like shaving. If you don't do it every day, it'll show. All right. And the thing that that, that means for me is the relationships. Um, that's the biggest thing in recruiting. Uh, for me, I'm in a little bit different position because I spent, you know, the last five years I've been recruiting a different position. And I know a lot of kids at the running back position, you know, really, really well that I've been, you know, talking to for a couple of years now. Uh, I haven't been recruiting tight ends like that for the last couple of years. So, you know, coming here and hitting, you know, getting my feet on the ground right away, trying to get to know a couple of guys that, that I watched on film while I had to sit in the office and do all that paperwork and whatnot. I really started trying to get to know who are the guys that we're going to go after. And uh, it, but I still feel like I'm behind, you know because there's some kids that are being recruited right now that I've been talking to for two years. You know, I've seen play high school games, you know, even though they're young kids, I've seen them play. So uh, that's not the case with these tight ends. So it's recruiting is all about relationships. It's all about getting to know guys and, 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 and talking to them and them, them getting to know you. And, and uh, that's where you have the edge. So, you know, being a part of a new staff, that's probably the biggest adjustment that we have right now with so many new guys. Uh, on our staff is, you know, you know, those relationships, especially if you like me, I change positions, um, then, then it's, it's just a little bit different, you know, where you don't have a list of guys, or maybe you weren't at this level, maybe you weren't at the level of Texas in recruiting those guys at your other spot, or even this geographical area, you know, so there's some challenges there with this staff with that. But uh, I know all the guys in our room, man, I seen them, they work hard, they're relentless, uh, you know, give us, Give us a little bit of time, man, and this thing's going to really take off. We're looking forward to it. It's great to, to see you again. Great to have you back uh, in Burn Orange, Jay. Appreciate you taking the time, and we'll look forward to visiting with you down the road. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Welcome. That's Jay Bulware joining us here on our Longhorn Season Ticket Older Virtual Huddle.